Shalom, shalom, and shalom. And what a great joy for all of us to see all of you. And we'd like to invite you to join us on day one of the Global Leadership and Pastoral Conference. And we are so glad to have you, all of you here, to join together with us. And we pray that you are going to be blessed abundantly as we come together for the global uh, unity, mission, and revival. And we thank God for the many powerful men and women of God have been sharing with us the word of God. And uh, now we are going to have uh, another great man of God, Apostle Derek Better. He is going to minister to us. And once again, welcome to day one of the Pastoral and Leadership Conference with the topic of uncompromising. And um, maybe some of you have seen different post poster. Uh, do not worry about that. All you need is to pay attention to the Zoom ID because we have this program uh, in different languages uh, within these 40 global days of prayer and fasting. So we, uh, we are standing in the gap together. So there will be many nations. So we have Vietnamese languages. We have Mandarin languages. We have Thai languages. We have Bahasa languages. Uh, we also have Burmese languages and English. We have two different channels in English as well. So do not be confused. Just pay attention to different Zoom live. And it's our great joy to have God's servant to come and minister to us today with Apostle Derek Bater. And he is the Apostolic Team Leaders of Dynamic Life Ministry International based out of Centurion, South Africa. Together with his wife, Uama, they oversee an Apostolic and prophetic presbytery of interrelated fivefold ministers who share the vision of building the body of Christ according to the authentic apostolic mandates given to the original apostle of the Lamb and the first ascension gift apostle of the book of Acts. Derek and Wilma flow in their gifts him to love his pride, feed his sheep, and equip his sand so that the church of the locality can flow in unity and every sign of God is released in their calling, assignment, and purposes to reflect his presence, his glory, and be his fragrance so that through every believer, the marvelous power of God can be seen in all on the earth. And we are so glad to have God's servant to come and minister to us right now. And uh, we'd like to encourage you. We still have about, um, uh, today we are on the day 18, so many to say, that we still have 22, 22 days um, for the Global Prayer uh, Conference. So we invite you to come and pray together with us. And especially on this 18 day, we are also praying for uh, God hands upon our neighbor. So just lifting our neighbors to pray together. And this, the word of the Lord is reminding us that on this day 18, with the theme, extending our hand to neighbors, we are going to send greeting and peace to our neighbor during the pandemic. Let them know that we pray for God's protection and blessing over them and their families. Let them know that their fears, their pressures and sicknesses could be overcome when they trust in God and pray. And remember what the Lord Jesus said, uh, the two commandments. First, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul and with all of your mind. And this is the first and the greatest commandment in Matthew chapter 22. From verse 37. And here, the second is like this. Love your neighbors and yourself and all the Lord and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And notes that in Proverbs chapter 14, mm -hmm. verse 21 said, whoever despise his neighbor is a sinner, but blesses is he who is generous to the poor. So let Amen. us continue to pray for the poor, our neighbors, the people surrounding us, so that we will, we will not become a sinner and we are not going to disobey the commandments of God and we're going to become the good Samaritan, going to preach the gospel to the nation through our care and love. And without any delay, let us welcome God's servant, Apostle Derek, to come and minister to us right now. And thank you so much, sir, for coming and sharing and praying together with us. And he has been sharing with us on every Thursday, okay? on every Thursday at 11, uh, AM California. So just stay tuned and come together and let's welcome God's servant. Thank you. Amen, Dr. Joshua. Thank you. Once again, such a privilege and an honor to be with you. And I just want to honor you and support the mission and the 40 days and all the conferences that you do throughout the year into many, many different nations. Thank you for sowing seed 
so generously, so beautifully that it would bring forth the harvest of souls and magnify God's glory and bring his kingdom to the fullness. So I thank you for that. I bless you and your family. I know with all these sitting for hours facilitating all the sessions, you probably don't sleep much. So I pray God's blessing and strength upon you as you just do what God's graced you to do. And I honor you, sir, as a man of God. And it's great to know you, great to walk with you, great to be a friend with you. And I feel right at home. I'm, I, I just love the fact that we are just so, so better together and so wonderful to preach and pray and prophesy as a team. And, and to all the other speakers in the thousand slots of this 40 days, I thank God for each and every one of them that you have just graciously hosted and so lovingly released the slots and given up your preaching time and many times to give other people opportunity. And I'm one of those that thank you for that opportunity. So thank you, bless you, love you for the team and where we can serve together. It is certainly a privilege. I love I love the, the countries that you're ministering in. I thank God for every soul in those countries, that God is turning things around to rise the church to the blossoming of the sound of the glory of God. So we thank God for that, and we bless you. Tonight, as we're talking to pastors and leaders, and we're talking about uncompromising lives, the topic for tonight in this session is living a devoted life without compromise. Living a devoted life without compromise. Now, the devoted has the connotation of loyalty. And Father, as we come to your word tonight, thank you that you are devoted to us, Lord. Thank you that you said you so loved the world, you gave your only son. Lord, you didn't say you love us because. You just said you love us. And so tonight, Lord, we thank you for that devotion. We thank you for that adoration that you have for your church and for your bride and your body. Lord, as we minister tonight, we pray that your word and through the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, lives will be touched and changed tonight. Lord, I pray that not one person would leave this session without being touched, changed, and having a purposeful encounter with you that will change lives and cause us to grow and flourish in the mighty name of Jesus. We praise you. We give you all the honor and all the glory, even before anything is done or said. It all to you, the audience of one, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. So when we're talking about loyalty, I want to talk about devotion. Loyalty and devotion are very closely related. They're cousins. And loyal, faithful, true steadfast and consistent, committed and dedicated, devout. Those are some of the adjectives in the dictionary for loyalty and for devoted. Many times we talk about being devoted husbands or we have a devoted wife. Are we devoted tonight to the call that God has placed on our lives? You see, many, many of us will, will stop short by saying we, we love the Lord, we, we give him honor, and we give him praise, and we're devoted to God. Are we devoted to the call, the assignment, and the mandate that God has placed on our lives? Because, you see, God has placed in pastors and leaders a great an awesome responsibility to do what God's called us to do. Whether he called you as the first base, whether he called you as second base, he's called you. We need as pastors and leaders to resign over and get over the fact where we've been called, how we've been called, and get ourselves to a position tonight that we realize we are called for the purpose that God intended. And so I'm asking the question tonight, are we devoted to the call that God has placed? Are we devoted to the responsibility that God has placed upon us? For he looked for a man 
to stand in the gap. And if he could find one righteous man, he would save a city. Tonight, my fellow pastor, fivefold minister, God looked for you because he wants you and I to fulfill the mandate, the assignment, and the purpose that he's called you and I to in the ministry tonight. And that's an awesome responsibility. Some people get puffed up with pride. Well, God called me. He didn't call Dr. Joshua. He called me. He didn't ask Dr. Joshua to do it. He asked me. That's pride and arrogance. That's not what God wants. I'm humbled that God, like Paul said, found me worthy, putting me into service. Even when I was unworthy because of my sin, because of the mess of my life, the Bible says the gifts of God are without repentance. Tonight, I want to encourage you. The gift of God on your life is without repentance, but it's not without commitment. It's not without loyalty. It's not without faithfulness. It might be without repentance, but it's with faithfulness, with diligence, with consistency, with steadfastness. God has called us for such a time as this. And we need to settle in our hearts that calling that God has placed on our lives, that responsibility that God has said, go do, go teach, go travel, go love, go get whatever it is that God has called you to do. Are we committed without compromise to be devoted? Turn with me if you have your Bibles open tonight. Let's look at the scripture. Let's go to Luke chapter 2, verse 36. I love this passage of scripture. It just speaks about commitment. It talks about loyalty. It talks about uncompromising. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phineal, of the tribe of Asher. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping and with fasting and prayer, day and night, along with the godly man, Simeon, who recognized Jesus as the Christ. There was also this godly woman, Anna, that's mentioned in the section of the Bible in Luke chapter 2. Notice what we're told about the life that she lived. Number one, she never departed from the temple. <laughs> Where, If you were looking for Anna, would you find her? You'd find her in the temple, worshiping and giving thanks to the Lord, making intercession, supplication, and prayer for the saints and the work of God. Anna, the Bible says, gave herself to worshiping, fasting, and prayer. Let me ask you tonight, call to the ministry as a pastor or a leader. What are you giving yourself to tonight? Are you giving yourself to the call that God has called you to? Or are you doing whatever and trying to fulfill the call? You see, those that will thrive in God, those that will be risen up by God, are those that will give themselves, like Anna here in, the, in chapter 2. She gave herself to the mission. She gave herself to the assignment that God had called. See, for her, worshiping, fasting, and praying was not a duty or an obligation. It was something that she didn't just fit into a busy schedule. She dedicated her life. She was devoted to the assignment or the call that God had placed on her life. Now, the Bible says that she was married for seven years and then became a widow. And now she was 80 odd years old. 80, the age she'd lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and she was a widow of about 84 years. So here's this 84 year old widow 
that stays in the temple continuously in worship, prayer, and fasting. And you know, some young people today can't even pray one hour. And we talk about being dedicated to the call of God, dedicated to serve the Lord Jesus. I want us to have a life like Anna, dedicated without compromise to the assignment and the call of God that he and he alone places on our lives. Amen. She worshiped with joy. For her, worship was not something she did out of obligation. She did it out of her heart, with every fiber, with every passion of her being. She worshiped the Lord. At 84 years old, I remember many years ago when I was pastoring a local congregation, I had an old lady, and I don't use that term derogatively, she was old. And she said to me, I want to serve God. What I can do, I used to be a secretary. I'd love to come and free. I won't charge anything. I don't want a salary. I just want to come and serve at the church and be your secretary. Well, I thank God for Agnes. She's gone home to be with the Lord now. She's graduated and gone to glory. But every morning, Agnes would come to the church office and do things for me, answer the telephone, file documents, make appointments. But the best thing that she did, she would sit in that outer office in front of my office and she would pray. When I was counseling people, when I had meetings with pastors, she would be praying. And, you know, sometimes people get excited and they raise their voice slightly. And the minute somebody raised their voice, the door would open. And here was Granny Agnes standing in my office because she wanted to protect me, see. <laughs> Glory to God. I thank God for that woman. She was old in the terms of she was in her, well into her 80s. But every day she came. When we had prayer meeting in the mornings, early morning prayer meetings, Good old Agnes was at every prayer meeting, even at her old age. She'd come. She'd be the first there on a Sunday morning before service. She'd be the first one at church to help set up and help pray before the meeting. You see, that's devotion. That's commitment. And that is ministry. Folk, I want to tell you tonight, if there's any, ever a word of, of exhortation, but a word of, 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 of input and impact, it's this commitment and loyalty to the call of God on our lives. Commitment and co 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 compassion for what God has called us to do. You see, she, she saw it fitting to pray, to fast. Wasn't a hunger strike. Wasn't it something she did three times a year because it was the religious thing, the order of the day. She did it out of a sense of joy to the Lord. What's our commitment like today? The Bible says, here's Anna. She was in the temple night and day. She never left. Church leader tonight, are we willing, are we willing to live this dedicated, devoted, uncompromised life? We will lay down our life, lay down our pleasures, lay down our comforts to fulfill the call and the mission that God has placed on our lives. See, you're going to hear many speakers in the conference and over these 40 days that'll, that'll get excited and preach and, 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 and bubble up. And, and, and I would normally do that. But as I was waiting on God today, for the last couple of days, in fact, for this conference, and it was pastors and leaders, conference uncompromising. I asked God, what would you have me share? And God took me to this passage and said, remind my people, remind my leaders that I'd love commitment, loyalty, and devotion. Because with a devoted heart, God can work. 
You see, many people want to study, and there's nothing wrong with studying. Don't, don't misquote me. Don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with studying. There's nothing wrong to getting degrees and, and things like that, that that advance our knowledge, and, and, and that's great. But God wants, apart from all of that, God wants our heart of commitment and loyalty. Because we can run on head knowledge, see? We can run on, and many do, they run on their head knowledge or they run on their charisma, their character, whether they're funny, jovial, or whatever, or, or just a nice guy, they run on that. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And the word tonight is a prophetic word. The word tonight is an alignment word. You might even say tonight is a corrective word. But God wants us to focus on our commitment and our dedication. Not just to love God, because we all love God. Not doubting that, not questioning that for a moment. But God asked me to say this. Are we committed to our commitment? Are we committed to the call and the assignment that God has placed on our lives to do what he's called us to do? Wherever you are, whatever part of the earth you're on right now, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, whether whether you're in a local ministry, whether you're serving itinerantly, that's not the importance. The importance is, are you devoted and dedicated to what God has called you to and called you for? You see, you might be sent by God and assigned by God. I'm sent to preach in Africa. That's the calling of God on my life. That's where he's asked me. That's where he commissioned me. And he said, I want you to go and pastor pastors in Africa. And many times I've been, I traveled to other countries and Europe, the United States and, and the Philippines and, and, and Korea and all of those places. And I love going there and teaching and apostolically inputting into those nations. But my call is Africa. And many times people have asked me to come and pastor a, a local congregation in a different continent. And while that is great and I would, I would love it and I would probably do a good job of it maybe. But I don't take up those appointments. Why? Because God didn't call me to those appointments. God called me to Africa. And I'm committed to my commitment. You see, there's many young pastors to, today and young ministers, and I want to encourage you. As you're starting out in your ministry and you're growing in your ministry, maybe God's called you to a small village of just a congregation that God says will be 300 people. And somebody says, why don't you come to another country and you can pastor a church of thousands? Well, you can pastor a church of thousands. But if God has called you to stay in that village and pastor those 300, then I would rather stay in the village of 300 and be in line with the perfect blueprint of God than go and be a pastor in a bigger place or a more glamorous place, a more comfortable place, whatever that is, and miss what God has called me to do. You see, the will of God, folk, tonight can be divided into three sections. There's the acceptable will of God, the good will of God, and the perfect will of God. Now, for that pastor that God says, I want you to stay in that village and minister to those 300, that would be God's perfect will. It would still be acceptable for him to travel to another country and, and be a pastor of a large congregation and have thousands of people. That would still be acceptable to the Lord because he's loving the Lord and serving God. But the perfect will of God would be for him to stay in that village with the 300 if that's where God put him, if that's where God placed him. And you see, so often the peer pressure, the glamour, the prospects of something easier, something better, something that makes me more proud will cause us to compromise what God has called us to do, what God has said we ought to do. We need to make sure that as we minister the gospel, doesn't matter where we are, no matter what meeting it is, we are true to the call on our lives and the assignment that God has put 
in and over us. That's what God is saying tonight. See, God gives the gift of prophecy to all of us because our sons and daughters will prophesy. Our young men will dream dreams. Old men will have visions. We need to make sure that we understand that God will use us anyway. But he's got one specific place, which is the perfect will of God for our lives. We need to make sure that we worship because it's a commandment of God. Worship him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and everything that is within us. Let us praise his holy name. Let us worship him. See, worship is not an, not a, not an obligation. Worship is not something we do because we have to. Worship is something we do because it's a lifestyle. So is loyalty and commitment. It's a lifestyle. Sadly, when I look at our young people today around the world, whether they're saved or unsaved, the lack of commitment is becoming evident. The lack of dedication is becoming evident in our young people. And I want to say to you leaders tonight, I want you to pray, prophesy, declare that our young people would get back their passion to be committed, get back their passion to be loyal, get back their passion to be dedicated because it's in those things that God can build foundationally and then things can be built off it. But where there's weak foundation, the building doesn't stand. God wants us to be like him. God is loyal. God is committed. God is devoted. God is faithful. Let us emulate Christ. Let us be imitators of Christ. Amen. We need to learn commitment. We need to learn dedication. We need to learn loyalty. That's why we have so many church splits. Young up-and-coming pastor or an assistant pastor doesn't like what the senior pastor says because they're still young and immature. They break away, run off, take some folk with them and go start another work. That's disloyal to the call of God. That's disloyal to the things of the Spirit. God, God wants you and I to be committed in the least so that he'll raise you up over much. Are you prepared to wait in your commitment? Are you prepared to wait in your loyalty for God to raise you and release you? Let me tell you, if God wants to move you, God will move you. Don't move without God. Don't move on your own. And certainly don't move in rebellion. I'm talking to somebody tonight. You might as well say, no or amen. You might as well say, oh, ouch, or oh, God, because God's speaking tonight. And this is a word. I know it sounds a little heavy. I know it sounds a little bit uh, 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 you know, clumsy, but I want to tell you, I, I want to obey God. See, I want to be loyal and committed and obedient to what God tells me to do. I'd love to jump around and shout and scream and get you all excited, and we'll do that at the next session maybe. But this session is a is is a is daddy's heart sitting with these children, having a daddy talk with these kids. And daddy talk tonight is be loyal, be committed, be courageous in your calling. Praise God. You see, what does the Lord require of us? It's a statement, it's a question. What does the Lord require of us in Malachi 6? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Commitment to justice, to love, to mercy, to humility, and to walking in our assignment with our God. Being godly means living a life that's pleasing to God, not living a life that's pleasing to my own flesh, living a life pleasing to man, living a life of compromise and manipulation. That's not a loyal life. That's not a dedicated life. That's a compromised life. I and mean, we've had too much compromise in the church of God. We've had too much watered down, polluted and diluted. Now it's time to get back to our commitment. Now it's time to get back to our calling. Now it's time to get back to what God has called us to. Amen. The keys through all of this is to walk humbly, to walk in humility. Lord, I'm just your servant. Walk with me, Lord. Talk with me, Father. Bless me today, I pray. We need to spend time together with Abba, Father. You see, loyalty, God loves us. And God's not really about the things. God's not about performance. God's about love. So one of the first things we need to be loyal to 
is our time with the Father, with Abba Daddy. Great that we can preach for 12 hours a day and jump from one meeting to the next. I've had, I've had about, I think it's now, this is the fifth Zoom session I've had today. And that's great. And I thank God for all the time and all the inputs that I've been able to share with all the different folk around the world and, and all the inputs that I've had. But you know, the best time today is my loyalty to spend time with my daddy, with Abba Father. Don't get caught up, pastor, leader. Don't get caught up in busyness that we're so busy that we didn't spend time with daddy. We didn't go to the father's heart. We didn't go into the throne room of God and spend time with him. Anna, the prophetess, was in the temple day and night. Some preachers don't go to the temple that often. They're in a temple with God. So busy in the program, so busy organizing the program, they missed out on fellowship time with God, quality time with God. Let's get back to what God wants to do in our lives. Amen. See, the change comes when we prioritize our time. I, I, I want to do two things. Spend time in the presence of God and spend time fulfilling the purpose that God has given me. So I just have two time zones. Presence of God fulfilling my assignment. God will give me the other times. Seek first, Matthew 6. Seek first the kingdom of God. I can say it like this. Seek first to fulfill your purpose within the kingdom of God. And all these other things will be added to us. See, God called me to Africa. He didn't call me. Although I'll visit other countries and that's on a, on a, on a, on a, a transfer, it's like being a good football player and I'm on a transfer to another club for a short season just to go and help out that other club. But I'm still a member of my home club. Well, I'm a member of the Africa for Jesus club because I'm called to Africa. See, I love traveling to other countries. I love ministering in other countries, but it's not Africa. So there's always time to go and it's time to come back. But when I'm in Africa, it's a time to stay because I'm committed to my commitment. I'm committed to what God's called me to do. And are you committed? Are you and I living tonight a dedicated life? See, ded dedication, an uncompromising commitment to dedication and a devoted life means time and quality in that which we're devoted to. Time and quality into that which we're committed to. Devotion brings both purpose and position. Devotion to what God's called us to do will bring us into position and bring us into purpose. I know so many ministers, friends, that are struggling with their position. The reason they're struggling with their position is because they're not fulfilling the assignment with dedication, loyalty. God wants us to be loyal. Remember, the scripture said, if you're faithful in the least, he'll make you ruler over much. Now that faithful in the least, we could say it like this, dedicated, devout, committed in the least, God will raise us up over much. Let's not run before we walk. Let's finish the walk. Cement the purpose before we fly even higher. Position and purpose through devotion. Placement and provision. You see, when we are dedicated to the call of God in our lives, when we're dedicated to fulfill the passion that God has placed in our lives, it'll bring us into a place of authority, a place of responsibility, but it'll also bring the provision of God in and through our lives because we're in the perfect will of God. We're in the center of the will of God for our lives and where we are there in unity with him, he will command his blessing. Provision comes when we're in unity with God. When we're out of unity with God, we struggle for provision. So if you have a lack in your life right now, ask the Lord to check your alignment. Ask the Lord to show you where you should be positioned relative to where you are positioned. Delight yourself in the Lord, the Bible says, and he will give us the desires of our heart. Delight yourself 
in the purposes that God has called for you to do, for me to do, and he will give us the desires of our heart. Are we dedicated? Are we committed tonight without compromise? Have we tried to negotiate with God? Well, I'll do this for you if you do that. That's compromise. That's manipulation. God doesn't want us to manipulate him. God wants us to devoutly serve him, love him, bless him, and he will add to us such as should be added. Jesus said it like this in John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains or abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, he can do nothing. Church, it's a sad truth. Outside of the perfect will of God, we're outside of the vine. And if we're outside of the vine, we can do nothing. We need to be dedicated. We need to be loyal. And we need to be committed to what God has called us to do. Are you ready? Do you remember when you first moved into the call of God in your life, how excited you were for that call? Maybe it was to, to go and pastor a new congregation. You were so dedicated, whether you had two people or 20 people in the meeting, you were so on fire, so passionate for that work. Well, maybe now it's a few years down the line, hasn't quite grown the way you thought it would grow. Maybe some of the folk are moaning a little bit too much. Maybe people are staying away because of the pandemic and because of their fear. Do you still get up and go to those meetings with the same passion? and the same dedication? Are you still committed with the same loyalty and the same desire to see God work in your midst? God's looking for a devoted life to the call and to the commitment without compromise. Let's not surrender our values. Let's not surrender our integrity because we've compromised to get something that we shouldn't have that we've compromised to make it easier on us instead of fighting the fight and winning the victory in absolute certainty. Let's not go soft on ourselves. Let us not go soft on the call of God in our lives. Let us stay focused and committed to the call that God has placed on us. So tonight, my friend, as we close this session, I'm asking you, ask God, Father, bring back in my life the passion to do what you've called me to do. Not out of obligation, out of a love and a desire to serve you, Lord, and to bring glory to your name. If, it's, if you're called to sweep the carpet in the church on a Sunday or before the Sunday service, sweep that floor with every fiber of your being like, your, like the fire was on the, on the house. That's devotion. That's the call of God that we need to walk in. That's the power of God that we need to have in our calling, the passion and the persuasion of what God has called for us to do without compromise. Church, a compromised life is a weak life. A compromised life does not bring glory because people can see whether we bluff them or whether we don't. Most people can see through compromise. So let's live a dedicated and a fulfilled life without compromise, without turning back. Let's live the devoted life to the passion of the call of God that he's placed us. Don't be jealous of your neighbor. Don't be jealous of your brother or sister that's doing something else in the kingdom. Don't be jealous over their ministry. Be passionate about what God has called you to do. Because I want to say to you today, I want to encourage you as we close, if you're committed in the least and you're faithful in the least, God will raise you up over much. It's time to sow where you are. Don't look at the other fields. Don't look at the other seed. Don't look at the other crops. Take the seed that God has given you and sow that seed into good ground. Sow that seed into fertile ground and watch God bring forth a harvest. And out of your sowing, he'll promote. Out of your sowing and giving, he will reward. Let's not be jealous of one another. Let's sow where God has placed us. Let's produce where God has planted us tonight. May you be blessed by this word. I trust that it's stirred you up. I trust that it's, it's shaken you up because I want you, by the grace of God, 
to be passionate about your calling, passionate about your commitment, passionate about living an uncompromised life to fulfill what God has called you to fulfill. May God bless you and may God prosper you as we walk in his word, his ways, and the statutes of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Dr. Amen. Joshua, thank you and God bless. Amen. Thank you so much, Apostle, for that message of challenging us to devoting our life to a life without compromising. And uh, many of us today that we have seen that there are certain even different denominations that they even appoint gay and lesbian to become the bishop. And they officiate even those uh, marriage. And um, what would be your point or your view on that? And how is the situation in, 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 in South Africa concerning about this position uh, when we know that is, is, um, that is not biblical? Well, firstly, I believe, uh, Dr. Josh, we've got to stand on the word of God uncompromising. Mm -hmm. Now, you see the difference and why, why the secular world governments are against the church or bringing pressure on the church is because many pastors and leaders have spoken out in judgment mm -hmm. instead of love. You see, we, we need, as the church of God, we need to differentiate. We need to separate the sin from the sinner. And God loves the whosoever. God loves the sinner. He doesn't love the sin, of course, but he loves the sinner. And we sometimes, as the church, got it wrong by judging the sinner instead of the sin. And so the world has raised an objection to the church saying we are judgmental and we don't give fairly to others. And then you've got another group of people that don't live by the word of God. They don't live by the statutes of God. And they've already compromised to a, say anything goes. So now we've got a double standard. We've got the wrong standard in the church, which is judgmental. And we've got the wrong standard in the world that allows sin to be sin and say it's right. So the, the position of the church is simple. We need to preach the gospel, love his bride, equip his saints and, and just love people. You see, I love, I love the people that aren't, aren't saved. I love the people that are living in sin. I don't love their sin. And if they ask me what I think, I'll tell them, I don't love your sin, but I love you. And Jesus loves you. And Jesus died for you, even in your sin, even in your transgression. Jesus died for you. You're welcome to come to church. You're welcome to come and sit in the assembly of the believers and receive the word of God because only the word that's going to change people. It's only the power of God that will change. You and I can't change anybody. You and I can't heal anybody. It's the power of the spirit of God. So all we do is create an environment of love and care, not compromise. We can't say to people, it's okay to be unmarried and live together. We can't say you're welcome to keep doing that. But, you know, if somebody comes who's in that lifestyle, I'm not going to make an issue of it from the pulpit. I'm going to love them until the Spirit of God convicts them. It's not my job to convict them. It's the Spirit's job to convict them. So I'm going to be uncompromising in my love. So that's our stand. That should be our stand in, 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 the, in the Bible. Now, our country, South Africa, right now, is busy publishing an act of parliament that makes it a criminal offense to, comp to, to speak and differentiate between sexual orientation and sexual preference and lifestyle. And they, they are saying that any pastor that stands up in his pulpit and says that gays, are, you know, uh, homosexuality is a sin will be guilty of an offense and liable to five years in jail. Now, unfortunately, what's going to happen, Dr. Joshua, many pastors out of fear will stop saying sin is sin. And that's what the devil wants. He wants to dilute the gospel. So we're going to have to find a way to speak the truth in love without violating law, but obeying the laws of God. 
And you see, as we come to the days of persecution, and that's what we see in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and 4, God says in chapter 3, these are perilous times. Mm. Oh, and if we learn to compromise now, Doc, in the little things of our life, our dedication and our devotion, when it comes to the big things, we're already halfway down the compromise road. So just going the extra mile won't matter. But if you stand on the word, you'll never slip, you'll never compromise, and you'll never slip, you'll never fail, praise God. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Apostle. And the same thing that we have begun to see, see that is happening also in America right now, that when we talk about compromise, in other, in other words, we talk about uh, that is an, an agreement or settlement to up a dispute that is riches by its side and making concession. <laughs> so mm. anything that we begin to make concession uh, and reduce the authentic, uh, authenticity or the biblical teaching of the word of God, then we are making compromising. Correct. And you know one thing, Dr. Joshua, whatever you compromise to win, you'll lose. Mm -hmm. It's a biblical principle. What you compromise to win, you'll actually lose. Hallelujah. Amen. May God will through this conference of uncompromising leaders that will begin to speak just like God's servant said, we have to speak in love. We are not going to condemn or we judge other people, but let's begin to speak in love and let the people understand that what they have done is against the way of God, the will of God, the word of God. So, so that we can bring them back and give them the opportunity for that, for them to come back to God. And even you see that many churches today that uh, they are okay with even abortion. And yeah. they said, there, I heard even some of the leaders said, oh, God can change his mind. <laughs> and I, I, and I, I'm just laughing. I said, how is it possible for that? It is impossible. Uh, but we need many of God's servants to stand up and begin to preach with the word of God that Amen. we are not going to begin to just like, like prosperity gospel. God bless it with prosperity. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you preach prosperity and you don't, you don't preach about the cross, then you begin to compromise the Bible. Biblical. You're already compromised. Yes, yeah. Uh, so we pray that God is going to help us. So as we are going to move to the next session, Apostle, let us begin to pray. And uh, this time we already move to pray for West Africa right now. So would you please just uh, after this, uh, this uh, video about Nigeria, and we'd, uh, we'd like to invite you to pray for Nigeria. And Amen. if you have any prophetic word for Nigeria or in any nation, or, and also praying for the people who are listening, that they will be bold to take a step that they are going to just today in America, that if we not very careful, we talk about the different gender. Now, even that the word, some word that is begin also, uh, we may be uh, fined for that one. And yet, as a Christian, we know that when God creates, God doesn't create someone in neutral. <laughs> the Bible say very strange <laughs> men and women. That's that, right, John. Yes. And, then, and, and you see, the Bible says we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. Amen. There's many pastors and leaders that are becoming ashamed or embarrassed of the gospel. We should never be ashamed of the gospel. Hmm. Hallelujah. So Because it's God. the power. You see, the, the Bible says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So when you are ashamed of the gospel, you're ashamed of the power unto salvation. Yes. And that's a great point, Apostle. So we, we, that's the reason why we see that when we compromise, there are so many dangers of compromising. When mm. we compromise, in, first of all, our life begin to compromise to the way of the world and be being transformed mm. by the world, world and not being transformed by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. When we begin to compromise to the way of the world, then the world see we have no difference. <laughs> Who you are? You want us to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, but your life living, you have no different than uh, to us. And maybe even sometimes it's worse. <laughs> and that's it. You see. In the worst oh, scenario, yeah. yes, they said about yeah, here's here's a statement that I've made on many occasions, hmm. 
and it's going to become real. If Christianity was illegal, mm. would they have enough evidence to convict you? Mm. If Christianity was illegal, would they have enough evidence to convict you? Mm. Many Christians, there's no evidence of them being Christians, so they'll never be convicted of Christianity. But for you and I, Doc, we will be convicted in a heartbeat because there's evidence of our Christianity in our lifestyle, in our word, and in our action. Praise God, praise God, praise God. But if Christianity was illegal, would they have evidence to convict you? Mm. And it's going to come down to that in the last days. Yes, yes. And that's, that is very right. So let us become, begin to shy forth for the glory of the Lord. And let Amen. Them know that Amen. we are his disciple. Amen. Okay. Amen. So let us pray for Nigeria right now. And uh, after this, and would you please also, uh, after this video, uh, with, with, as we pray together. Jehovah God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I come to you representing the nation of Nigeria. I've come to confess the sins of our forefathers, the sin that is going on in Nigeria, the sin of people that are shedding blood and they are using politics to do religious fight to Lord God, especially in the northern part of Nigeria. Lord God, in the north, it is getting too much. Lord, people that you paid for, that you shed the blood for, people are wasting away because of religion's riot, because of political violence. Jehovah, have mercy upon Nigeria this moment. I ask that your mercy will prevail over the judgment that is raging over Nigeria now. Every power of the enemy that is working against Nigeria, that is working against your church, because your word said your church will continue to prosper and the gate of hell shall not prevail against. I ask that your church will continue to prosper and you will cause unity and your love to begin to move in the heart of your people, in your church, oh God, that your first love that your church have will be restored so that your church will come in unity and in love one more time. And everyone that is involved in politics, that they will have the fear of God, even among our leaders, sin of bloodshed, sin of corruption, Lord God, sin of selfishness, but I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you will intervene so that righteousness will exalt in the nation of Nigeria. I stand against every power of the enemy that is ruling against Nigeria. That, oh God, your name, your righteousness, your holiness might be preserved even in Nigeria, even among our leaders, among our kings, among our political leaders. I cry unto you, Jehovah. I look up unto you, therefore intervene in the affairs of Nigeria. Let there be restoration of peace in Nigeria. Let every violence stop, O oh God, and let the gospel continue to prosper. That there will be unity even among the people's group, O oh God. The Hausas, the Hebrews, the Yorubas, the Tevis, the Hebebios, the Kanori people. O oh God, have mercy. Lord, restore peace in Nigeria. Lord, let your compassion be drawn toward Nigeria. Save Nigeria, oh God. Save your people, oh God. Save your church, oh God. Let there be salvation in Nigeria. We pray for our president. We pray for our citizens, oh God. Lord, your word says, God, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That you will cause them to have your fear. That they may have wisdom to rule us effectively. To rule us in righteousness. To rule us in truth. To rule us in holiness. To rule us in purity. Thank you, Jehovah God. Thank you, Jehovah God. We give you praise, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name, I have declared. Amen. Nigeria and just deliver the prophetic word and just minister to the people right now. Amen. Father, we thank you for 
your nation of Nigeria. And Father, we call it back from the grips of political corruption and the lusts of the flesh and the manipulation of the enemy to cause the people to stray and to compromise. Lord, I come against the, the counterfeit of the Holy Spirit, come against the, the false prophetic, and I pray, God, tonight that you would establish the truth in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, that the truth would be declared. I thank you, Lord, that the majority of, of the Nigerian people are God-fearing people. Lord, I pray that you would visit that nation with the power of the fire of the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, they would not turn to gimmicks and programs and sorcery, but, Lord, there would be a move of the Spirit of God across that nation that would cause the, even the rest of the region of, of West Africa to be changed and to be saved. Lord, I thank you for the prosperity of your people, the prosperity of the country, that, Lord, you have given them wealth above many other countries in Africa. So, Lord, I pray that that wealth would not be exploited and manipulated, would not be controlled or contrived, but, Father, that, that wealth and that knowledge would be in the hands of the church, the people of God, that it can be administered fairly. We speak life over, over Nigeria and end to violence, end of political instability, and the end of terrorism and tyranny. Thank you, Father God, tonight that you're raising up leaders with a heart after God. That, Lord, their parliament would not be a place of heckling, but it would be a, a place of hallelujah. I pray, God, for a change in their parliament. That the blessing of God and the power and purpose of God would reign in those cities. And that there would be decisions made that would honor you, Father God. You said, blessed is a nation that would serve you. I pray, Lord, Nigeria would be a nation that is blessed because they dedicate to serve you. Bless their leaders, Father, this day I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Apostle uh, Derek, and we're looking forward to see you on next uh, uh, Thursday. So would you please just stay tuned and continue to pray with God's servant, listen to God, uh, the word of God through God's servant on every Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. California time. Thank you so much, and may God bless you abundantly. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joshua, and to, to my brother Joshua Nicholas, as you take the next session, may God really bless you, touch you, anoint you, and bring fire that will change nations and change God's people in the mighty name of Jesus. Good, good day. God Amen. bless you.